Hello, my name is Mike D. Ah, thank you. That's right. My name is Mike D, field engineer out of North Carolina. Hi, my name is Jeff Harmon. I'm a systems engineer out of the great state of Texas. Got some logistics for the call. First, welcome to fiber optic basics and handling. Our goal is to make this as interactive as possible, more live video, less slides. Ask questions using the chat window. All comments and questions are viewable by all the attendees, so please keep them professional. If you ask a question outside the scope of the fiber optic basics, we may table it for a later YouTube uh, session, or we may answer them at the end if we have time. The live stream is being recorded. They'll be available for later viewing on YouTube. We do plan to do future YouTube live sessions. One of them certainly would be OTDR, the mystical launch cable length. I can think of about five different scenarios for launch cables. So that one, we would give you live examples and explain the differences. Also, if you have something you'd like to see covered, please request it today via the chat. Some examples could be CWDM, DWDM, MPO, or fiber to the home. I'll now go to the agenda slide. And for the slides, we will introduce a topic. Then we plan to do a camera. So it's like we're doing a live demo with you on site. And then we will go to screen share so we can use camera and screen share to explain and teach topics rather than just using slides. So there's our agenda. We're gonna cover wavelengths, fiber types, connectors and adapters, APC and UPC. Make sure everybody knows DB, DBM and how to explain it. Attenuation, bends, proper fiber handling, especially with regards to fiber inspection and cleaning. If you're new, we'll give you some tips and tricks to help your job be a little bit easier and more efficient. And if you're senior, we expect we'll teach you something new and give you tips and tricks to help teach your new people. So I'll go to the next slide and it covers the spectrum. And that is the light that we use to transmit in telecom. So we transmit in nanometers and a nanometer is for wavelength. So the wavelength is the speed of light divided by the frequency. So frequency is in terahertz and we divide speed of light by frequency, we get nanometers. Now, if we look at a rainbow, we might all know Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. Those are visible colors. Our telecom transmissions are in the infrared spectrum. That means they're invisible to our eyes. I will show you a visible tool that is useful in the industry. Uh, one, it's a red light shooter. So if I hold up a red light shooter and turn it on, it shoots red visible light, it goes down to the end of the span, and then the light comes out at the end. In this case, there's no light coming out. So if I reach in and grab this fiber, I got the red light flashing on the camera. It might appear to be white, but this tool helps us find breaks in jumpers, breaks, in connectors or bad connectors, and if it goes all the way to the end, then it helps us to verify continuity. Now I'll take a good jumper that is not broke. I will plug it in to the red light shooter. And now at the end of the jumper, red light is coming out. You might not see that on the camera, but this helps us to identify continuity a red light shooter commonly goes about four to five miles. 
I will now switch to my PC software. So we can see the invisible light. So how do we do that? Right now we're looking at a fiber interface and we'll cover what that is today later on, but I'm going to turn a laser on. So I'm pressing a button and now I'm shooting 1310. So when I look at that image, I see a white dot in the middle. So even though that light is invisible to my eyes, the camera is picking up 1310 in the infrared. I will now change the wavelength to 1550. And as soon as I go to 1550, that invisible light is not visible by the camera. So sometimes an inspection scope can see infrared light and sometimes it can't. If you're supposed to be on a unlit fiber or dark fiber, and you see white light flashing on your inspection scope, it is time to plug that fiber back in because you may have just unplugged live traffic. This also brings us to safety standards. I looked up the safety standards for red light. It says our eyes will look away or we will blink before it hurts us. That did not make me feel too safe. It's saying I have to look away before I get hurt. So the invisible light, if it does hurt our eyes, it's not bright, you can't see it. It can hurt our eyes without seeing it. So the rule of safety for lasers is do not look at the end of a jumper, do not look into an SFP because something could be on. It's just a good, proper safety habit. Next, we're gonna go to the next slide which shows the size of fiber. So I have a little connector here and very hard to see on the camera but there are 12 little fibers. I have a small screwdriver head. I put it right next to it. So if you can't see, it just lets us know these are very small. These actually have coating on them. I'll try to separate. I have two fibers separated. If you can't see this, okay. These have coating on them, so they're actually fairly big. If you have no coating on a fiber, which is plastic or colored, you're looking at about the size of a human hair or just a little bit bigger. So even though we handle a fiber in our hands with a jumper or a connector, the fiber itself is very small. Next slide says we're gonna go over fiber types. So the fiber town, tra the light travels down a piece of glass called the core. It's surrounded by another piece of glass called the cladding, and there's some protective coating on there to protect that fiber. From there, we put plastic on it. We put it inside a cable. There's Kevlar. There's all kinds of protective stuff. The core on single mode fiber is typically about nine microns, and the cladding is about 125 microns. In multi mode, the core tends to be 50 or 62.5 microns, and the cladding is 125. Your average human hair size is about 80 to 100 microns. So if the fiber is stripped down to just core and cladding, it's about the size of a human hair. And we said the single mode core size is nine microns. That's nine millionths of a meter. That's about the 10th of a size of a human hair. So a patch panel, jumpers, connectors may be fairly big. The piece of glass that's carrying your traffic on single mode is a 10th of size of a human hair. So one thing we'll do now to show you the core size is we'll inspect some fibers So I'm going to inspect a single mode fiber on my camera. So I will plug it in. We'll, co we'll cover single mode and multi-mode in more detail. I see a white dot in the middle and that white dot tells me it's single mode. It looks like it's about a tenth the size of the cladding. The cladding is that gray circle. It's a single mode fiber. Now I will switch over to a multi-mode fiber. We said the core size is 50 or 62.5. I plug in now and I see that the light in the middle is about half the size of the cladding. So if you thought this was a single mode fiber, you can look at the scope and tell that this is a multi-mode fiber. And we'll give you some other ways how to identify the fiber type as well. So now I will turn it over to Jeff so he can cover fiber in faces. Thanks, Mike. As Mike said in the previous slide, this. The actual fiber itself is 120, 1 1.2, 125 microns, which is about one, about the size of a human hair. 
But when we get down to the core, and the core on a single mode fiber is commonly around nine microns. If you used a magnifying glass and you looked at the end face of that fiber, you still could not see the core being nine microns. It would take a high powered microscope to see that end face. When we look at fibers, there are two different types of fibers out there, fiber end faces. There's what we call an SC, excuse me, a PC or for a polish, excuse me, physical contact and an APC for an angled physical contact. A lot of folks will call them PC for polish connectors or UPC for ultra polish connectors or APC for angled polish connectors. Um, but they're actually physical contacts is what the P and the C mean along with the A being angled. I doubt anybody's going to call you out or the fiber police are going to come and say, well, that's the wrong terminology. I hear, I hear a bunch of different things out there in the field. If you look at the diagram there, when you look at a PC connect, connector, those fibers end faces are not actually cut flat. They're, cut, they're, they're manufactured to have a slight curve and a radius on them. Same thing with the APCs. And that radius is designed that so when we plug those two fibers in and they meet, um, we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to mate the uh, core, the cladding, and some of the outer contact area. So, you know, the analogy I like to use when I'm out with technicians, if I have two bowling balls, I'm not trying to mate the entire bowling ball. I just want to mate that center contact area. So if I push those two bowling balls together, I'm going to mate in the center parts of those bowling balls. Now, if you're out there and you've been working on fiber, we have, I'll hold one up, I've got a PC here, and then I have an APC. Now, the PCs are blue connectors, the APCs are green connectors, and a lot of folks out in the field are saying, hey, we're seeing a huge shift from the blue PC connectors to the green APC connectors. And folks, you know, why is that? The answer is very simple. APCs are angled, or what we call angled physical connectors or angled polished connectors. They're cut at an eight degree angle. So when we mate those two eight degree angles together, what happens is the back reflections, about a, we have about 125% less back reflection with an APC. Any back reflections on that interface get reflected off into the cladding and out into the um, outer jacket area. So losing those back reflections is really key on high-speed fibers, especially move as we move from 10 gig to 100 gig up to 400 gigs. So also, when you look at the blue and the green connectors, we've got APC and we've got a PC or UPC here. The first thing I tell technicians, these are not compatible. They're not compatible in any way, shape, or form. If you plug, if you physically plug those in, there is a high probability that you're going to do damage. So I'm going to switch over to my um, my PC software. I'm going to bring up an APC connector. Now this was given to me by a technician when I was out with him. Pardon me. Share my software. Dang it. Sorry. thought I did. Okay. Sorry about that. I didn't have my software up. Okay, so I'm going to plug in. And what we're going to see here, this was given to me by a technician. And he said that he had been given. Okay, and it fails. So he said he had been given this, um, this jumper, this um, PC jumper to use on his APC interface. OTDR. And he kept plugging this thing, plugging this thing, plugging this thing in. And finally, when I was out there doing some training with him, he says, this thing just doesn't work. And when we inspected it, we could see the damage from the APC onto the PC connection. I could see the same damage on his OTDR. And so when I explained to them that this was not compatible in any way, shape, or form, and you can do physical damage, well, he did physical damage. He actually let me have that fiber so that I could use it in, in uh, prior to, or next training classes to show technicians about that damage. So move on to the next one, fiber jumpers, and no 
So when we look at fiber jumpers and connectors, man, they come in lots of different shapes and sizes. There are a ton of different fiber jumpers, fiber connectors out there. So we talked about having our end faces as PC or APC. Well, then we come out and we have, okay, we have different types of connectors. We have different types of fiber jumpers. So I'm gonna hold up a couple single mode jumpers here. So I've got some single mode jumpers and these are PC, they're both blue. And one of them is yellow. One of them has a blue jacket. Is there a difference between the blue and the yellow? They're both PC. Yes, the blue jackets are what we call bend and sensitive fibers. Now they came out with that a few years back and fibers that were showing up were bend and sensitive fibers were showing up as blue. Well, I ordered a whole bunch of new fibers uh, a couple weeks ago and my new fiber that I got is yellow, but it is also bend and sensitive. So not everything is, not every jacket means the same thing. If I look at multi-mode fiber, multi-mode fiber, people say, hey, the fiber jumpers are orange. Now the, the connectors on a, on a multi-mode fiber will always be beige. Remember single mode, they're either gonna be green or they're gonna be blue for PC or APC. So I have this orange multi-mode fiber here that actually has LC connectors on it, which I'll talk about in just a second. There is also an aqua blue color multi-mode fiber, which is OM3. Could also be OM4 out there for higher speed multi-modes. Now again, the fiber connectors are still beige. When we go to, um, when we start looking at the end faces, we've got end faces out here. We've got smaller end faces for LCs and larger end faces for our PCs out here. So I've got an LC connector and I've got a um, UPC connector here, or a excuse me, an S a SC connector, sorry. And they are different, they're different sizes. Your, P your standard connectors, your SC connectors are 2.5 millimeters on the ceramic ferrule that, are, that surrounds the fiber. The LC jumpers have a 1.25 millimeter jumper. So if I look at, if I bring this back up again and I look at my SCs and my LCs, you notice that they are different sizes. Well, you're seeing, an, as I talked about earlier, we're seeing a rapid shift to the uh, APC connectors. You're also seeing a rapid shift to the LC connectors. The answer is simple, it's smaller. It's about half the size of a Sam Charlie or an SC connector. So now I can get twice as many connections into the same amount of real estate as I was getting with my SC connectors. Now, if I look at bulkhead adapters, I've got a bulkhead adapter here. This is a double one. This happens to be green, it's for APCs. If I flip it this way, it's for a Sam, it's for an SC connector. I also have a smaller version which is for LC connectors. This one is for um, PC connectors. This green one here is for LC connectors. Now the kicker to this is, is both this, both the blue and the green are the exact same size. Only the color is different. We try to, they color code them to try to keep people from not plugging in the incorrect fibers, plugging blue in the green and green in the blue and what have you. So inside these, mating adapters, bulkhead adapters, whichever one you, there's a hollow core in there. And there's two ports for it to plug in. Again, this one happens to be double. And that sleeve on the inside aligns the, aligns the fibers as they go in there. One of the common mistakes that technicians make out there when they plug in fibers is they go to plug that fiber in and they have that connector there and then they go to plug their other fiber in and they say, yep, we're plugged in here. So it looks like I am physically plugged in and I've gone on on troubles with, with technicians and things like that. And what do I find when you go up there, you actually push and you can hear that click. And now that physical connection has taken place. Although if I just unplug it slightly, it still looks, it'll hang there. It still looks like it is physically connected until it goes click. So that is one of the key things. That's one of the troubles that technicians will do. Sometimes they think they've got it plugged in. 
also understand when I plug these fibers together and you hear that click on here, that click tells me that there is 2.2 pounds of force across that two and a half millimeter ferrule. Okay, not much. But when I break that down to the glass, to the uh, core and the cladding and some of the outer contact area, that's 45,000 PSI of pressure. This will make more sense when we get into inspection and cleaning. So we talked a little bit about mating sleeves. I moved on to my next slide and I got a little bit ahead of myself, but there's different types of mating sleeves out there. So even if you have an LC connector and you're going to an SC or whatever the case may be, there are different connectors out there for you. I actually have an, a connector here, a bulkhead adapter that is SC on one side, LC on the other side. So one of the questions I get asked a lot is, hey, Jeff, all of our equipment out there are um, FT connectors, and we've got this new equipment that's in a box, and it's all LC connectors. How the heck are we going to get these to go together? Well, there's things out there called hybrid cables. So here's a hybrid cable that I have right here, and this happens to be an MPO fiber on one side, and Mike will talk more about that. And this MPO fiber is APC because it's in green and it actually has 12 fibers in it. Some MPO fibers may have 24. On the breakout, on the other side of this being a hybrid fiber, I have 12 LC connectors here that are PC connectors, so they're blue. So I've got green APC on one side, I've got a fan out or break out of 12 LC connectors that are PC. So there are many different um, fibers and connectors out there. You'll see, you'll see older fibers out there that are um, Sam Tom and Frank Charlie's. So different type of connectors. Oh, sorry about that. Different type of connectors here. I have single mode. I have duplex fibers, things like that. So as we move into that stuff, it's very important to understand that you have these mating adapters that they can't, you know, there's a mating adapter out there for what you need for whatever type of fiber. There's hybrid fibers out there for whatever you may need. Okay, I'm gonna move on to my next slide. Jeff, we do have a few questions. Sure. Um, in our head end, I see green and blue jumpers plugged into each other. Mm -hmm. Should these be changed out? You also say there can be permanent damage using these, and I'm not sure why. Okay, so I showed the permanent damage. Remember when we mate that, um, excuse me, the APC to an to an SC connector, I told you there's 2.2 pounds of force across that two and a half millimeter ferrule, but there's 45,000 PSIs across the glass. So you take an angled piece of glass and you plug it into a relatively flat piece of glass, and there's a good chance that something can give. And I showed it, I showed one of those where the technician had continually done it and ended up breaking the fiber in face. Also, he damaged his OTDR. Now, I have gone into many head ends, many COs, and I've actually seen blue plugged into green, and they're working circuits. And... It's one of those things, it's a 50-50 shot if it's gonna work, but if it does, it's gonna be on a very low speed fiber, typically one gig or less. As soon as you move to 10 gig or 100 gig or 400 gigs, there's no way that that is going to happen. And what you're gonna create is you're gonna create a ton of loss in that connector. And it's usually about five dBs. So on my um, on my fiber check pro saw, on my equipment here, I'm going to show you that. So right now I'm going to switch over to the power meter. And I've got my power meter here transmitting and I'm receiving an, a neg 3.53, I'll just call it a neg 3.5 dBm. And I am uh, SC to SC here. Now I'm going to flip this around here a second. So give me a second here to flip these around. So here's my SC to SC and I'm going to unplug that and I'm going to plug in my LC, oh, did I plug in? Oh, plugged in the wrong side here. 
Okay, so now I have this, and remember we were getting about a three, three and a half. Well, we just jumped up to 4.75. So almost a 5 dB hit from having um, an APC connect, or excuse me, an APC connected to a PC connection. So again, it may work if it does, it's on lower speeds. Would I change it out? I would bring it to the attention of my of my uh, managers and my engineers, and at some point, they will probably want to change those out, um, especially as they move up. They may, they may just decide, hey, we're going to upgrade in speed here, and all of a sudden, what was working now isn't working. So hopefully that makes sense. Thank you, Jeff. And we, we have another question. We sure. have some older equipment that has ST connectors. The newer okay. equipment we just pulled out of the box uh, has it interfacing with APC connectors. How are we going to make that work? Okay, simple thing is hybrid cables. So I talked a little bit about that um, in the previous slide. There are hybrid uh, fibers out there that you can get in, you know, in any connection that you want. You can have a PC on one side and APC on the other. You can have an APC on one side, an ST or an S, you know, an SC or an FC, a Frank Charlie connection. So there are a ton of different scenarios, but. Uh, cable manufacturers, people that make fiber optic jumpers can make you whatever configuration you want in whatever length you want. So I'll hand this back off to Mike. Thank you, Jeff. Let me launch my PC software. And we're going to talk about MPO next. So Jeff mentioned we went from large connectors such as the Sam Charlie, Sam Tom, Frank Charlie, and a lot of people like those because their fingers can easily work with them. In the space of one Sam Charlie, I can fit two Lima Charlies. Lima Charlies are not very small. They can be broken pretty easily. They're hard to handle with our fingers. A lot of people don't like them. Well. Manufacturers of the world have competition. Real estate is an issue in a comm room. Everything is shrinking. So I'm holding up a Sam Charlie and I'm gonna put an MPO right next to it. It's a little bit more rectangular, but now this connector, which is an MPO or MTP, has 12 fibers in it commonly, sometimes 24. So everything gets more expensive. And if we broke one fiber on a 12 fiber connector or 12 fiber jumper, then we got to replace everything. So if you don't like Lima Charlie, you know, we're going to be going to MPOs more and more and more. We see them in the data center, but we see them in the service provider space as well. The other thing interesting about it is you may or may not be able to tell on the camera, but one of these connectors has two little pins on it and the other one doesn't. So normally we say a jumper is male, well, now I have a jumper in each hand. One is pinned and one is unpinned. So that makes it a little tougher. There's a key or not, so it only goes in one way. And now we have polarity. If we connect these together, is one going to one or is one going to 12? So compared to your traditional Sam Charlie or Lima Charlie, these things just get a little bit harder to work with. One is green, so it's APC. And the other one is a multi-mode, it's yellow. So just be aware if MPO comes, you're gonna need a little bit of training on those and we can host a YouTube live on that as well. Next, I'm gonna to go to cables. So if I pop up the slide for cables, we're not gonna cover these too much. Most of us handle fibers at a patch panel with a connector or optics or SFPs. We just plug in and transmit or receive. It's the outdoor folks or contractors who come in to splice indoors or outdoors, and they actually handle the cables. In general, there's a bunch of tubes in a cable and a bunch of fibers. So I do have an example here. I showed you the small ones before. Here is some that have more coating on them. I got 12 in my hand, they got different colors. The colors tell the outside people and splicer people, which is fiber one to make sure they splice fiber one to fiber one. If people are working with cables, they're gonna get the class and they're gonna get the training. And commonly, they're 144 or 288 in one cable. 
In those days, I remember somebody saying, why would you ever put in four fibers? Now the largest cable that I'm aware of is up to 6,912 in one cable. That huge fiber count will start to see in data centers. We'll go to the next slide, which is the difference between DB and DBM. So we need to know these terms in the telecom space. And I will go to a class and say, does everybody know what DBMs are? They all tell me yes. And I say, can anybody give a class? I've never had a technician give me a class. So we're going to give you two key points today. The first point is DBM. The M means absolute measurement. And in fiber, it's milliwatts. In copper, you could have millivolts. You could have milliamps. And we speak in the milliwatts. The other thing is, if we go to a light bulb, we might have a 20 watt bulb, a 15 for outdoors, 60 bright light in the, the room is 100. We just say we got a 10 watts to 100 watts. Well, if we go into the fiber world, we could go from one watt to milliwatts to microwatts, and that's thousands and thousands and thousands of numbers. So rather than make us have watts, milliwatts, and microwatts, and say it's one one hundredth of a milliwatt, we go to DBMs. So now we can go from plus 30 to neg 30. That's only 90 numbers, right? 30 up and 30, 60 numbers, 30 up and 30 down. So that means they're like rhythmic. When you do testing, the tester will do the math for you. So if you look on the slide and it says 10 milliwatts, if you add 10 milliwatts plus 10 milliwatts, that's 20 milliwatts. You can add milliwatts linearly. But if you add 10 dBm plus 10 dBm and say it's 20 dBm, well, 20 dBm is actually 100 milliwatts. So that shows that these are logarithmic. We jam a whole bunch of numbers in a small amount of space so it's easiest for us to talk. Notice there's a negative 10, a negative 20. That doesn't mean reflection. It doesn't mean other direction. It just means it's a very small amount of light. One milliwatt is zero dBm. If you get a little hotter, you're in plus dBm's. If you get a little weaker, you're in negative dBm's. When you do your tester, it's going to do the math for you. And then I'll go to the difference between dB and dBm's. I'm going to use money to show this. I had to get it from my wife's wallet. I got wife and kids, so I don't have money in the wallet. But here I have 420s. I call this dollars M. It's real. It's absolute. You can touch it. You can see it. You can buy something. But if I said I have 420s, how much money did I lose or gain? You have no idea because you don't know what I started with. So in order to get DBs, you have to have a reference point. So in this case, I say my reference point is five $20 bills. It's $100. Well, now later, if I show you I have four 20s, you know that because you started with 100 and now you have 80, you lost $20. So absolute money, real measurement, $80 is dollars M. What I lost is gone. You can't see it. My kids took it. That's DBs. It's just dollars. So if you can touch it, feel it, or see it, light is too hot, light is too cold, that's DBMs. But if you have a loss, that's because you did a reference, and you have to have a known start point. So I will go to the tester to show that. I'll turn on my laser, and I'll go to a power meter. And the power meter says I'm getting about neg 3 DBMs, 2.88. Well, I'll hit a reference on the power meter. When I hit that, it's going to go to zero. So that's basically saying I know know how much money you have. So in order to do DBs and loss, you always do DBs. If you want to see if a laser is hot at SFP, it's DBMs. If you just want to check light at the end of the span, it's DBMs. So the same thing would go for weight. If I said I weighed 180 pounds, you might say, wow, Mike, you look great. You lost a lot of weight. But if I was 120, you say, wow, Mike, you don't look great. You gained 60 pounds. So the difference between DB and DBM is you got to have a reference. The next thing we'll do is I'll go to the slide is we're going to talk about bends. So if we bend a fiber, light can leak out of it. The higher wavelengths are affected by bends more than the lower wavelengths. So typically, 
13.10 doesn't get hit by bends too much, and 15.50 is five to 10 times worse. So I'm going to hook up to the meter now, and I'm going to put some bends and show you what happens. If you study some stuff, it'll say Ben's safe radius is 10 times the diameter of the cable. Maybe it's 20 for outdoors. Uh, I just use the soda bottle reference. If I can wrap around a water bottle, a drink can, that is a decent radius. When we go into building, the ducts in the floor or in the ceiling are not L's, they're S's to make sure we respect Ben radius. And if we're going into equipment, there's usually pins that we wrap stuff around to make sure we respect the bend radius. So right now I'm at negative three dBs on my power meter. And if I start to squeeze this, I'm doing a 180. And as I squeeze, I'm now at seven dBs, 10 dBs, 11 dBs. So with the little squeeze, now I'm at negative 14, we got 10, 12 dBs of extra loss from the small kink. If you kink it, you can break it. Or if you can kink it, you cause so much loss that you can make the traffic not work. So we have to be very sensitive to our bend radius. Not so bad at 1310, but 1550 or higher wavelengths, you can definitely bring down the traffic. Roll the card over it, close a lid on something, smush something, kink it up in the shelf, and you can bring down the traffic. So now I'll stop my screen share and turn it over to Jeff so he can cover some information on dirt. And since we're moving from connectors, loss, APC single mode, a good time for questions. If not, we'll keep going and we'll cover inspection and cleaning and dirt. You might do have a question. How do you perform a reference? Okay, so thank you. And there's a couple things for Reference, it depends what space we are in. What do I mean by that? In the enterprise space, they do a one jumper reference or a three jumper reference. Why is that? Because they have short fiber. So short fiber has tiny loss. Uh, I'll eyeball it, it might be a little bit wrong, but if we were on 100 meters of fiber at 1550, it might be 0 0.002 on the fiber. Tiny, 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 you can do the math, but it is tiny, 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 0 0.0 something or 0 0.00 something. If we expect a connector to have a loss of about 0.25, we connect on one side, we connect on another side, we have 0.5 dBs of loss from the two connectors. So they want to include or not include those connectors in their loss measurement. When we go to the service provider world, they're at 10, 30, 40, 50, 60 miles. So if the span has 25 dBs of loss, it's the fiber that leads to the big amount of loss and we don't care so much about one small connector. So what that means is if I'm doing a one or two or three fiber reference, I connect the source to the power meter with those jumpers and then on my screen share, I hit reference and then you saw it go from DBMs right to zero and now I have a good reference. So what that means is if I had $500 bills, it's saying, okay, Mike, I know you have $100 or $500. It just knows what I have. So now when it sees the money I've gained or lost, it's got the reference. So most power meters, you just hit a reference button and it's gonna zero it out. It's gonna know exactly what the source is, take into account the jumpers and the connectors. Thank you. So Jeff, you'll go to uh, dirt now? Sure. Thanks, Mike. So the next phase that we're gonna get into is how much, we're how much will dirt and debris, what will it do to my fibers and things? So we're gonna move into inspection on fibers. And we have something at, at Viavi that we call IBYC. Always inspect before you connect. I preach it when I'm out there. I show them, I teach it to them. Um, and it's just, it's huge because when you get these fiber jumpers, you get your new equipment, F technicians say, well, the fiber jumper just came out of the bag. It has to be clean. Well, maybe it is, maybe it's not. As I told you earlier, 
I, you know, I, I bought a dozen new fiber jumpers and I had a 65% failure rate. You know, sometimes both jump, both sides were good. Sometimes one was good. The other one wasn't. So when I'm out in the field and I'm working with technicians, I go out in the field, we're going to work on fiber troubles and things like that. It's kind of ironic. And I get the same thing from my peers, 70 to 80% of all the fiber troubles I go out on are dirty fibers. You know, they assumed, or they, they, you know, they said they hit it with a click cleaner a couple times and said, okay, they didn't inspect and they plugged in. So that's huge. And then when I look at, you know, somebody says, what's the other 20%? Well, it could be fiber breaks, um, could be something silly, like they not make the click on the fiber. There's a whole host of things that can happen, but inspection and cleaning is the single biggest thing that faces service providers and faces technicians. So if we look at these, um, if we look at my display right now, the top left where I show the optical uh, spiders, uh, fiber spider, as I call it, this is actually another one of those APCs to um, PC mismatches where somebody plugged it in, that in face broke and it, uh, it damaged the fiber. The other fibers, if you look at the cores are basically all covered. None of these fibers in this picture would actually be able to transmit, um, transmit data or transmit light down them. They're filthy. So as you start, as I, as I work with technicians, and I see this all the time, and what I typically do when, when I talk about inspection and cleaning is I'll put my Fiber Check Pro software up on the screen like I have here in a minute, and I have everybody bring their equipment up, and we clean and inspect. I mean, we inspect everybody's equipment, and maybe one time out of a dozen or 15 technicians, I get one technician that's really into the inspection and cleaning and their equipment is, is pristine. Sometimes I get in there and I wonder how stuff worked because it's so compacted full of dirt and debris. It's what we refer to as the mud pie. So I'm gonna bring up on my, uh, on my PC software, I've got a fiber jumper here and I've got an SC um, or PC connector here. This is a Sam Charlie and I'm gonna plug in and we'll go ahead and inspect this fiber here real quick. And it comes back and tells me it fails. It says the A zone failed, the B zone failed, the C and D. Well, next question I get is, hey, Jeff, what do all these zones mean? So the A is your core, B is your cladding. C is the adhesive that um, binds the uh, outside of the core to the outer contact surface material. Whatever that, whatever that protective material is going to be. So in this case, I've got a dirty fiber. Um, I may have just taken, you know, this might be one of those things, you just took it out of the bag. I'll take my click cleaner, I'll give it a single click, and I'll plug it back in here. And I have, I definitely see some dirt out there in the outer contact area. I hold it still here. There we go. So now I've got A, B, C, and D. There's some dirt and debris out there in that outer contact area. That outer contact area is very far away from the core and the cladding. So if this was the only fiber jumper I had, I could probably get away with it. Me, I'm the type as I'm gonna hit it one more time and clean it and see what happens. So next thing I'm gonna, so we're gonna go down to the next slide and we're gonna talk about oils, or excuse me, uh, permanent fiber damage. What happens when you know? What happens when you continually plug fiber jumpers in? Because I get this all the time. A technician's given their piece of fiber equipment. They're given a fiber jumper. Most of the time, they have no inspection, no cleaning equipment. So again, they assume, hey, my piece of equipment came clean from the factory. My fiber jumpers came clean from the factory. They keep plugging them in. So now what I have is I'm going to plug a clean fiber. I'm going to do this demonstration using. Um, using my uh, software here, I have a clean fiber and I'm gonna plug it into a fiber that's got some dirts and debris on it. So when I make that first mating, um, across that two and a half millimeter ferrule, there is 2.2 pounds of force. Doesn't sound a lot, but when I put it across that the fiber itself, the actual glass, there's 45,000 PSIs. So all the dirt and debris just exploded on that initial contact. I'll do it a second time. On the second one, the dirts and debris exploded again. Now it's starting to cover the core. On the third mating, 
it just continually gets worse and worse. And on the fourth mating, you know, at this point I have what's the beginning of the mud pie. My core is completely covered at this point. Not going to have much success transmitting anything. And that was just four times. Think of how many times if you're out there in the field and you keep using the same jumper, you don't clean and inspect what your ports actually look like. So I'll transition over to the next slide. And the next slide, we're going to talk about oils, skin oils and things like that. So a couple of my fiber jumpers that I got actually had oils on them from whoever put the little plastic cap on them. So I'll do a demonstration here in just a second. But touching the end face of a fiber isn't necessarily that hard. If I go to put the plastic cap back on my fiber, I might inadvertently with my finger touch the end of that fiber and I've gotten fibers right from the manufacturer that way from the person that put them on there. Did they mean to do that? Absolutely not, but it happened. So now I've got oils and things on my, um, on my um, fiber end, and if I plug those in, those oils are going to explode. They're gonna, they're gonna be shot out um, with the pressure there. In the picture here, you know, this is after I plugged in, you can actually see what we call the coffee ring, the ring around the outside of the core uh, outside of the cladding there and that is the outer contact area the fiber so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take my fiber here and i'm going to make sure i'm going to go to my fiber inspection pro and it's not it's like i'm not sharing inspection scope here we go sorry okay so I've got a relatively clean fiber here. I know I have the dirts and I have that dirt off there in the outer contact area. I'll just go ahead and, and I'm gonna go ahead and take it here and I'm just gonna dab it on my finger real quick. So now I'm gonna put this back in and I'm gonna do an inspection. So I put it back into the bulkhead connector and I plug it in and I inspect this. Oh, dag nab it all. I moved it right at the end. Sorry. So now we can see all of the oils and all of the oils that I put on from my finger on there. There we go. Much better. Now I'm going to take this fiber and I'm going to plug it into another fiber. And this fiber was clean. So I'm gonna plug it in there. It makes that click. I just put 45,000 PSIs across it and I'll plug it back in here, plug this in, give this center this thing up and give this an inspection. Dang nab it all. Okay, and now you can see all the oils, the fiber failed, you can see all of the oils that have been dispersed outside, and you can also see the coffee ring from the outer contact area. So oils and things like that get on fibers inadvertently, and the, and the problem is, is if you inadvertently did touch that fiber and you plugged it in, depending on the laser source, that laser source could um, – basically burn that oil right into the end face of that fiber, the fiber that you plugged into and the end face that it's connected to. And now you've got damage on both sides because it was burned in. So I'll turn this back over to Mike. I'll launch my PC software and now we're gonna cover the coffee ring or a halo. So if you look at the slide, there's a question why is there a coffee ring or why is there a halo, whatever you want to call it on my fiber? And this is a tip or trick for new folks as well as senior folks. Jeff mentioned there's a little dome, the radius of curvature on the fiber. And when we contact, we meet to those two domes, like two bubbles meeting, baseball, baseball, bowling ball, bowling ball. So Jeff just did the oil and we saw a ring the liquid is smushed to the edge of that ring. Well, if I go to my PC software, 
I have this guy connected to a tester for a couple of days. And when I disconnect, I now see the circle. That shows a contact area. So you can see the fiber is perfectly clean, but there's that ring. So when you have the bowling ball, bowling ball touching, I call the space where they stop meeting the nook and cranny. As airflow comes across, we get dirt in that nook and cranny. So you can see I'm inspecting a jumper with my probe. So if I disconnect and see the coffee ring, wipe it off, plug it back in, and I'm good for 25 years. If I unplug and I see a coffee ring and there's dirt plus a coffee ring, it was dirty when we plugged in. We got that huge pressure holding the connector together. All the dirt gets stuck in that nook and cranny and no dirt is going to move to the fiber. So this is just another example to show that there's high pressure because there's a dome. Notice in this case, the circle is not perfect. When the manufacturers make these things, they put that bubble or dome on the end of it, but it doesn't have to be a perfect uh, circle around the cladding. Many times it is, Jeff's was, you can see mine is a little bit off center. But because the fiber's clean, remove that ring, plug it back in, and I'm good for 25 years. If we go to the next side, the question is, why is the core visible sometimes and why is it not? So this is also a tip and trick. We see in the slides that one picture has a core and one doesn't. So I have a hybrid jumper in my hand. We can see that one side is blue and one side is green. So I'm going to plug into the blue side and inspect and see how there is no white dot in the middle. There is no core. So why is that? I don't think you can see it in the camera, but the probe, the probe has a little, oh, I can see it there. The probe has a flashlight that comes out and that acts as a camera flash. This jumper is now hidden in the tip, so it'll be totally dark. Jeff inspected in bulkheads, so it's totally dark. The little flashlight in the probe, it's LED, acts as a camera flash. Well. I shot light into this blue guy. It went down, there's an angled connector. It kills a back reflection, so there's no light to come back and be in this core, so there's no weight dot in the middle. Now I will inspect a UPC to UPC. You can see I got a blue guy and a blue guy. I will now plug in and inspect this UPC. And in addition to having dirts on there, I got a little weight dot in the middle. Why is that? That flashlight goes hits the end of this jumper, light comes back down the core and we see the white dot. If you inspect an OTDR, it's terminated. There's nothing for the light to hit and bounce back. So OTDRs won't have it. If you inspect at a patch panel, it's connected to miles of fiber. That's killing back reflections. If you did expect at a patch panel and you saw some white light, then you can expect a dirty connector several feet away causing back reflections. If you don't see the core, it is there. If you're using a digital scope and it's past failing it, it's going to look for dirt in the center. If there's dirt, it's going to fail. But if there's no dirt and you don't see the core, it's going to pass and the fiber is going to work fine. The next question is, is the dirt on the fiber or on the lens on the next slide? Uh, so this is a common question we get. How do I know if the fiber is dirty or if my camera is dirty? So if I inspect the fiber, I will plug in a jumper into my camera. I see some dirt on there. If I spin the jumper, notice how the dirt is moving. I spin the jumper the other way, the dirt is moving. If the dirt moves, it's on the jumper. If the dirt does not move, it's on the camera. So with most probes, you remove the tip. There is a lens right there. Now take an optical wipe, wipe it, clean it, and then your scope is good. If you're inspecting bulkheads or jumpers and you're not spinning it and you see the exact same piece of dirt on 10 fibers in a row, maybe that's time to think about is the dirt on my camera or is the dirt on my jumper? I'll now turn the slide over to Jeff and he's gonna talk about some more inspection as well. Okay, thanks Mike. So when we do inspections, this comes down to really what I refer to as tips and tricks. You know, I want to do this, and I, when I inspect fibers, I want to do this as um, efficiently as I possibly can. So if you have a 
uh, if you have some type of digital microscope, we have a P5000i and a FiberCheck Pro, and they both use the same, they'll both use all the different same inspection tips. So right here, I have a bulkhead tip for an APC, and then I have a, a tip that goes right over the end of the fiber. And the one thing that you'll never ever see me use out in the field is I'm never gonna use this fiber, this inspection tip that's actually gonna plug in and go directly over the fiber itself. And the reason being is very simple. If you give me a fiber jumper, we're out to we're out to do an install and I have a fiber jumper, I've typically asked technicians, hey, how many inspection and cleanings do we have? Well, they'll say, well, two. I've got my fiber jumper right here. I got the two ends. I said, yeah, but what about what you're going to plug into? Oh, yeah, we got to clean those two, huh? Yes, you have to inspect. You have to clean those two. So now if I take my fiber tip and I, and I plug it in and I go right over top of the end of the fiber, I can inspect both sides, make sure they're clean, do all that. Life is good. But then I have to go and I have to take the tip off that, and then I have to put my bulkhead tip on to go into the bulkheads of the equipment. So what I do is I tell technicians, get yourself bulkhead adapters. So I've got a bulkhead adapter here. This one happens to be a um, SC, PC, it's blue. So what I do now is I take my PC uh, bulkhead adapter and all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug this thing in and now I can do my inspection right through here. So I'll come over here, I'll do my inspection. And I'm clean. So once I know that's clean, I can unplug from this and then go over and plug into my bulkhead on my equipment and do the inspection there. If it's dirty, then I can clean it. I can con you know continue the inspection clean till they're both clean. Now I can plug the same now I can unplug my fiber from my bulkhead adapter and plug it directly in and it's clean. I didn't have to switch tips. Also, the problem with switching tips that I find out in the field is once you take that one tip off and you set it down, did you remember to pick it up and put it away before you left? A lot of technicians will tell me, yeah, I can't tell you how many tips I've lost. I'm now down to a couple, so I'm having to use bulkhead adapters. That's wonderful. Um, so I've got you know, I've got bulkhead adapters. I've got blue for PC connectors. I've got LCs out there as well. I've got APCs. I actually also have a SC on one side and an LC on the other. So the question is, hey, can I inspect and if I've got a jumper that's going from an SC to an LC connector, can I use the same inspection tip? Absolutely. So I'm going to take my uh, I'm going to take my tip here. And I can plug into the fiber, and I can plug my LC in. Oops, wrong side, wrong one. Sorry. I can plug my LC connector in, and I've got an SC tip, and I'll plug that in. And I can now do my inspection. Even though I've got two different types of tips, I've got a bulkhead adapter that allows me to inspect the smaller LC with the SC. So again, I'm all about efficiency out in the field and they make these inspection tips, you know, in, they, in the bulkhead adapters, they make them in green for APCs, they make them in blues for PCs and things like that. The next question I get is every now and then I get a technician that calls me and says, hey Jeff, we're out here doing some inspecting and all of a sudden my inspection scope stops working. I can't get anything. All I'm getting is a dark picture. It's not focusing. I've tried manually focusing it. I've tried to auto focus it. I've tried to do this. I've tried to do that and nothing's happening. And I got to be honest with you. When I first got into fiber and I was doing inspection, I got bit by the same bug. So having done this a few times, what I do now is I ask the technicians, okay, what type of fiber jumper do you have in your hand? What color is the connector? And they said, well, it's blue. Or it's, you know, in this case, they'll say it's green. I said, okay. So I've got my APC right here. And I said, okay. So they plug it into a bulkhead adapt adapter in my case. And I said, what inspection tip do you have on there? 
well, heck, I don't know. I just got an inspection tip on there to go in my bulkhead. So they'll describe it to me. And I said, is it round or is it angled at the end? He said, no, it's got a round connector. Ah, oh, there's your problem right there. You're plugging a PC into an APC connector. So remember the APC connectors is manufactured at an eight degree angle. So when I plug this in and I do a live demo, no matter what I do here, I'm not going to see anything. I can try to auto test and auto center and auto focus and do all those things. All I'm going to get is dark where I'm going to pick out the outer contact area and things, or sometimes I may pick up a half moon, but I'm not going to be able to inspect this fiber and actually see what's going on when I have that mismatch. So, it's one of the you know it's, it's one of the common things that happens and it's just like okay we've been doing so many upcs and now i have an apc so hopefully that makes sense hopefully those tips and tricks make sense get yourself some bulkhead adapters get the type that you need to do your inspection and that way you can typically use either the apc bulkhead tip or the or the sc bulkhead tip um to do your inspections mike hand it off to you Thank you, Jeff. Let me launch my PC software. And then on the next slide, we see does cleaning on a shirt or blue jeans work? This is rhetorical. Feel free to type in some comments. So what I'm gonna do is gonna try it. There are dress shirts. Many times they are silk, Gore-Tex or something fancy. Many of our work shirts are cotton or flannel. So I'm gonna throw up some flannel flannel on my shoulder and I'm going to clean this guy one two I'm gonna rub him I pull him across my flannel cleaning on my shirt or blue jeans several times so now I'm gonna ask you if it's clean because I just cleaned on flannel and what my technique in the field to do is I get people tell me they do all kinds of tricks there are field tips and tricks I say are you betting lunch that what you just did worked they normally say wagering is illegal at this establishment. I'm like, wait a second. I just bet you $10 barbecue and banana cream pudding, and you won't take it. But yesterday, you did it 100 times on stuff that cost thousands of dollars on a multi-million dollar network at a multi-billion dollar company. So if you're not going to bet me $10 in a training environment, don't do it on your network. So now I will plug in this fiber, and I will inspect and it's permanently damaged. So you say, well, Mike, you tricked me. Normally it does get off dirt. Well, first of all, there's stubborn dirt. It's caked on, baked on like a mud pie because of pressure, temperature, humidity. I sure it ain't gonna get that stuff off. Next, if there's permanent damage, cleaning doesn't get off permanent damage. If you don't believe me, go to your truck, go to your vehicle, take some pebbles, crack your windshield, and then try to clean it. It doesn't fix it. If you have airborne dirt on, on there, sometimes a shirt or blue jean, works just fine. Earlier I did this today with Jeff and I ran it across that flannel and I had two big pieces of lint coming across the whole uh, fiber. So in that case, it might've removed dirt, but I picked up lint. So if you're cleaning on your shirt, my question is, how do you clean the bulkhead? Here is a bulkhead. The fiber's sitting way back there about a half an inch. I said, how do you clean your shirt to one guy? And he said, I take my shirt off. I was like, okay, we don't need no sensitivity class to realize that you're joking. But what he's saying is, I do not clean the other side of my connector. So the example that I use is take your eyeball glasses, put them in the mud and clean one side. You never do that with your eyeball glasses. So don't do it with your network. If you go to the next slide, now we have cleaning materials and we could take these via Q and A. Wipes are common. Optical grade wipes, not tissue that picks up lint. They're fine for jumpers, but jumpers only. There's cassette cleaners. I have a blue one. Clean top is famous one. It's green. They clean jumpers only. Then we have cleaning sticks, different kinds for 2.5 and 1.25. Most of them click. You can hear that click. Here's a click. Put on a cap. This cleans the LC jumper. Take off the cap. This cleans the LC bulkhead so I can get in the bulkhead. Some people say sticks don't work. That's because, here's an example. There was two dirts on one fiber. The guy clicked it, said it's not working. I said, give me that. I clicked it, 
there was one dirt, I clicked it, there was zero dirts. So you get one clean per click. Also, some of them have a button push. If you push the button, that pulls the tape across. The cleaning sticks, the tape comes flat across and does a 180 twist. So just because you get one clean per click does not guarantee it's going to be clean. Let me make your windshield or, or your window or mirror dirty and then bet some money that you can clean it with your eyes closed with a paper towel. So you get cleaning per method, but the only way to verify that it's clean is to inspect it. That stubborn dirt's not going to come off with a dry clean, and I just tricked you with that permanent damage. Cleaning ain't going to fix a cracked windshield, right? You either got to get that free resin that goes in there, or if it's cracked, you got to get your windshield replaced. So that's a little overview on inspection and cleaning. And then we can go to Q&A to see if there's more questions on the different types of cleaning materials. That does include our presentation in terms of slides, camera, and screen shares. We appreciate your time today. Hope you learned something, whether you're new or senior. And now we'll see if there's any additional questions. So okay. for closing remarks, we covered different fibers, single mode and multi-mode, long haul, short haul. We covered loss, we covered reference, we covered DBs and DBMs, we covered APC and UPC, we covered bends, we covered inspection, and we can cause permanent damage, different ways to inspect, different ways to clean. So if you're new, hopefully it helped. If you're senior, hopefully you picked up some tips and tricks. If you already knew, hopefully now you have some stories to explain to your new folks. You can take a shortcut in cleaning, but there's a risk of permanent damage. Even if you don't cause permanent damage, you can cause two, three, four, five, six dBs of loss. You got a multi-million dollar system and the system's not working. In my time, I've had two people say, I clean on my skin. I jokingly thought I jokingly said, you need to use the Perel. And the person said, I did use Perel. I'm like, well, let's check the label. It's not fiber grade touch that fiber like Jeff did, all of us have oil, it's going to be gooed out, and now you plug it in, you cause a loss, and that laser can fry it in there and cause permanent damage. So we appreciate your time today. It's session is available if you need to relook at it or have some other folks look at it. Thanks, Mike. Well, you know, as for my closing remarks, just remember, if you're new to fiber, this can be intimidating. And don't just assume that, hey, my fiber jumpers are clean, everything is clean. As Mike and I said, and what we see out there in the field, 70, 80% of stuff that we go out on are silly mistakes. You didn't clean and inspect your fiber. You assume they cleaned and now they're dirty connectors and they're causing, they're causing loss. They're causing other issues that we pick up with our OTDRs and some of our other equipment. So never, never make an assumption that something is clean, always clean, always inspect. One thing I'll bring out is the LC connectors. So I have an LC connector here somewhere, and they're very small. So when you have an LC connector patch panel, and I've been out with technicians many, many times, we're going to unplug a fiber to do some testing, and they get their fingers in there, and they inadvertently think they have hold of that small LC connector. They unplug, and they inadvertently unplug the fiber next to it, and then they stick it right back in there. And I'll typically want to stop them and say, you know, remember that outer contact ring that Mike talked about? The longer it sits out there, the more dust and debris and things that are collecting around it. And by unplugging it, chances are something may have fell down in there when you plugged it back in, even though it was only for a split second. So you may get lucky and say, hopefully this didn't put a problem. But if you put a trouble in there, how many hours is it going to take? to get that report to come in, get somebody dispatched and somebody to get out there and work on that. It could be five, six, seven, eight hours that another customer's out of service because you inadvertently unplugged. So always inspect and connect. Go ahead. Oh, so question, can the P5000i connect to the iPhone microscope? The answer is no. 
iPhone does not allow a USB to the iPhone connection and for our mobile for our mobile software to bring it up. It works just fine on on the Androids and things like that, the Galaxies that are out there, but it doesn't work on the on the um on the iPhones with the iOS system. I guess Mike, you want to take I guess the question is how is it fouled? If it's dirty, you can you know you can always clean it. If it's scratched or pitted and chipped, there's no repairing that unless you want you know it's cheaper to it's cheaper to go ahead and just put another fiber jumper in there than to try to polish it out. And Mike, you want to comment, comment on that? One comment on that, the pass and fail standards, they realize how hard it is to keep a fiber clean and pristine and perfect with no dirt. So the cable manufacturers and network equipment manufacturers, they have a pass fail standard. If you have a digital scope that does pass fail, it's going to go against the IEC standard. And then there is also a TIA standard for enterprise and in building people that use that same IEC standard. It does allow for some dirt. The other scenario is you have some red dirts, it fails, but the fiber will work. So that is possible. But the reason why it fails, as Jeff mentioned, if you have three dimensional dirt, and how do we know if it's three dimensional? When you plug in, that dirt can explode and move around. So it can fail, you plug it in, it works. And then you unplug over time, and then all of a sudden that thing that failed and worked is now failing and, and not working. So it's up to you guys. People plug in dirty fibers all the time, and they work. They may fail later. They may cause permanent damage. But if it is not working and it's permanently damaged, a dry clean don't get it, a wet clean don't get it, then the solution is replacement. So a couple items, if we're doing OTDR and inspection at the same time, we can have it set up. So now we see fiber one inspection, fiber one OTDR, fiber two inspection, fiber two OTDR. In terms of editing, it depends. If you wanna change the fiber name, the cable ID, you made a typo, then we can go and edit job type information, but we can't change any of the parameters. So if you have an inspection image and it fails, it's failed. You can call it a different number. You can call it a different name. Maybe you say fiber one initial fail, fiber one pass after replacement. So you can't change any of the data and we have a timestamp. So if you inspected at a, a certain time and they all failed and you went somewhere else, you're like, wait a second, why does this say Saturday at noon when nobody's law in our building on Saturday? So the time step helps us to confirm that the work was done at the right, right time. And then the other possibility now is geostamping where we can look at the timestamp, but we can also look at the geolocation. So we see testing was done at the job site and, and not on my tr truck at the a Walmart where I'm just fake and results. So editing on actual results, not editable, but editing job info is editable. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a fiber here. Uh, Mike, I'm going to grab control from you. And I'm going to share. So give me a second here. So while he's pulling that up, the other scenario is sometimes if there's a pit, chip, or a hole, it appears to be white dirt. That's like there's a gouge in the glass. So you all the dirt we've been looking at is mostly black. Well, if you see a white piece of dirt, it could be a hole, a chip, and it appears white. And then sometimes there's a whole bunch of dirt. It causes so much horrible back reflections that – it just appears to, to be white. But once again, dry clean it, wet clean it. If you do a wet clean, dry it off. But if you wet clean three, four, five times and you're not positive exactly what you're looking at, 
then at that point it becomes a permanent damage. And Jeff's pulling up a scope, so we okay. can these cameras. So that. So, so right here, I go ahead, Mike. But does that mean are we talking about the fiber? Or are we talking about on the scope? So right here, I've got this, and this is that APC to PC mismatch, and you can actually see the the chips, the chips and the pits, and the scratch that goes across here. It's actually reflecting light back, and you can also see other other uh, chips in there that are reflecting the light back. That's permanent damage. There's no amount of polishing or anything else that's going to take that out of there. Short answer though is is yes. If the fiber is yes. damaged, then we can see a pit, we can see a chip, we can see broken glass. I had one where the APC was plugged into a, a UPC. First of all, it was single mode APC plugged into a multi-mode. That should not have been done. Garden hose goes to garden hose, fire hose goes to fire hose. Well, he's taken a single mode, which is a small core, like a garden hose, and connected to a multi-mode, which is a big core, like a fire hose. And then he did an APC to UPC mismatch, and then that actually exploded the fiber so it just had a bunch of cracks all, all over the place if i couldn't identify that it was a crack or damage i would just have to look at it and say this thing is horrible it's not transmitting any traffic it has to be replaced so we'll, we'll, we'll both take that one uh, my answer is is no, and if we can see my camera, I'm holding it up. If I take a tip off, that's the end of my lens, and the camera is inside of the probe. So if our lens gets dirty, we can wipe it off. I also say we can take a picture through a screen because we focus out. So there's commonly a little bit dirt on the lens, and we still can see. But I was in one session a long time ago. I said in four years... I've had three pieces of dirt on my, my lens, and then I inspected, and there's a big old lint coming all the way across my lens that I could see in the display. I was like, okay, it's been five years, and now I've had four pieces of dirt. So once again, we tell you to spin the jumper. If the dirt's not moving, it's on the lens. Now you can wipe off the lens and get that thing clean and go back to inspecting. Yeah, we said you got optical wipe because we could use Kleenex. And boy, if, if I was in a jam and I didn't have anything, I, I'm going to use whatever kind of cloth I have. But we don't want to scratch the lens, right? You have eyeball glasses. You have these special cleaners. Tissue is going to leave a bunch of lint and junk on there. But any wipe, preferably, preferably optical, is going to get the, the dirt off that. Now, when you put the probe in, a lot of times I'll see – text take off the tip and put the probe in like this well now that's a lens and now it's not about getting dirt on it it's cracking it chipping it busting it messing it up so i always leave a tip on to protect my lens and i don't take this off sometimes we have to just switch to a specialty tip but leave this guy on so you don't get no mud pie down in your camera jeff and i commonly fly every week and i have a probe i take it on the airplane i go in the sky pressure and temperature change and when I land and I go to my next site, I expect that I'm going to be able to open up that probe and not have any dirt on it. So I don't have no planned maintenance period. Do it every six months. Do it every year. If you see some dirt on the lens, wipe it off and, and do it. Like I said, happened to me three times in four years. And right when I said that, I was like, oops, it happened to me four times in five years. So no plan schedule for me. You spin the fiber and the dirt's not moving. It's on the lens wipe it off, but make sure you do protect that lens by putting a tip. Now with the JDSU Acterna Viavi probes, we can actually take the tip off. So if you did drop this and smashed it to pieces, it's not a repair. You can at a low cost, order a new lens, put on a new lens and your camera is still good. If your lens isn't removable and you break it, now you have to send your lens back in for repair. One other thing I'll add to that question is, and I get this question sometimes is, hey, I've got a bulkhead, and I notice, Jeff, you're always cleaning, you're always inspecting through your bulkheads. 
and it's got the it's got the uh, hollow sleeve in there. How often do I need to clean that hollow sleeve? To be honest with you, I've never had to clean one. Um, could dirts and debris get inside one? Sure. And could that impart onto the fiber? Yes. But I've never really seen it um, happen in the field. I say it could, you know, in theory it could happen, but that's not one of my priorities is worrying about whether this is clean. I'm more worried about your fibers and your end faces and everything else. Are they, are they actually clean? Yeah, I agree there. And to me, you have to drop it into a mud. You have to drop it outdoors. You dropped it in a mud puddle. At that point, it's just a hollow shaft. You can use whatever you want, water, sink, get all that crud, throw some swabs in there, make sure that shaft is empty. But we get that question a lot. Hey, uh, if I plug into a mating adapter, it's going to get dirty. Well, when we connect to a network, those little mating adapters in the patch panel, we're plugging the optics. We're sticking down a shaft all the time. So it's possible, but extremely, extremely rare for that to cause dirt to get in the fiber unless there's some kind of mud pie in there because we dropped it in the mud. Okay, we have another question from uh, Bard Torgensen. Uh, can you please take a quick tour through inspection profiles? So, Jeff, you want to go to screen share? You're sharing. Do you want uh, yep, I'm... So, the IE, okay, I'll let you go to your screen share, Jeff, and I'll talk. The IE okay. standard costs money, so somebody can order it. But if you go to the scope and you go to a profile, profile IEC, you can look at the profile, and it shows you, the user, what dirt is allowed. So some of them I don't have memorized at all. I think the IEC single mode says no dirt in the core. No dirt bigger than five microns in the cladding. You can have small dirts as long as they're not too big. No dirts out there in zone C, which is a contact area bigger than 10 microns. So you can go and look at the profile and see exactly what the specification is. I had one company call, I think he was a VP. So my techs say, you're failing all of my fibers. Can we have a call? And I said, sure. So we had a call. I said, I'm going against the IEC standard. That comes from the manufacturers of equipment, the cabling, the providers. So I pass a fail against that. I said, if you want to create your own pass fail, you can, but now you go to these big multi-billion dollar companies and third party companies and say, hey, I'm passing this or failing this. Well, then the, the VP said, how many of these failed? The guy goes four, he goes replace them now. So if everything is clean and they had thousands of fibers, they had to replace four. So keep it clean, you're gonna pass. And, and Jeff, you got the profile? So that shows them, there's also, uh, notice how it says addition two. Addition two allows for a bigger zone C. We would fail a lot because in that epoxy ring, if any of the dirt touched zone B, it would fail. And then you can go into the scope settings, and if you open a profile, it will tell you exactly uh, what it is. No dirt allowed in the core. And if you want to create your own, then you could do that as well. So, so I brought Jeff, that up. Yeah, he just hit view, and you can see maybe it's a little small, but I see zone A. And it says scratches and it just says defects. So rather than us talk, if you have a scope, you should go and look it up and see exactly what is allowed or disallowed. Once again, you could fail and the fiber works, but the reason why it fails is they don't know if it's three dimensional dirt. They don't want it to move around and cause permanent damage or get, get migrated over to the core. So hopefully that answers that question. If not, you can follow up. So we're still here if you'd like to ask more questions. Mike and I will be here. We'll give you a few more minutes. Mike, anything you want to add while we're waiting for more questions? 
Well, I appreciate the time. If you'd like to drop, go ahead and go go ahead. But if you'd like to ask some questions, go ahead and type them in. And also remember, well, this was fiber basics, inspection, cleaning, handling, optics, connectors, some tips. Hey, I can inspect the SAM Charlie with the Lima Charlie or that kind of stuff. If you have a topic you'd like to cover for your market space, be it cable, telco, or enterprise, a lot of us are all doing the same thing nowadays. Then chat in a request and we can cover that. So we do have uh, one additional question from uh, Jaime Burgos. Uh, how much optical power can a microscope support? Okay, so what I think that means is we hop onto a live fiber and the scope is gonna get hit by live fiber. So I did it today and I was coming out about next 3 dBm so when I showed you that the scope was seeing 1310, uh, I'm sitting about zero and it didn't hurt my scope. Uh, I don't know if there's a specific spec. I think at some point, and I've shot red light right into it and just saturated the whole thing. So I think in general, it's not going to, to damage the, the camera. And then the other scenario is if we think we're expecting an unlit fiber, a dark fiber, a fiber with no traffic, if you're at 850, 1300, 1310, and you see a bunch of white light in there, uh, you need to say, why am I seeing light via my scope when this fiber has no light on it? My class is an unlit fiber that has traffic on it is not unlit, it's lit. Uh, and you have to be the person who brings that down. In the old days with Jeff and I, old timers, it was three days of pay for a T1. If you bring down a 10 gig, you might call that a resume generating event or a career changing event. So if your scope is saying uh, there's light on there, I'd be worried less about damaging the $1,000 or $2,000 scope as opposed to bringing down an entire state or an entire region. So ideally that should never happen because we expect the fiber to be dark when we unplug it from a, a, a network. Yeah, and to piggyback on what Mike said, at 1310, you were able to see that light. If you plug into a live fiber at 1550, you're not going to see it. And Mike, I don't, I don't know about you, but I've never heard of anybody saying I burnt my scope out because I plugged into a live fiber accidentally. Yeah, um, same. We, we, I don't know I, if I've just never seen that. Yeah, I've never heard anybody say it got, got fried. Same. You know, and I work. We work. We both work a lot with cable providers, and cable providers tend to tend to have a lot hotter signal than the than the telco service providers out there. And I know we've accidentally plugged into live fibers before, and I, I again, I've never heard of anybody doing uh, damage to the scope. So, any further questions? If you have any comments, in the old days, we would do slide presentations, right? Hold all questions at the ends. So we try to mix it up today, show the camera, go to live shots. So if you have any suggestions, suggestions, nice, positive, constructive criticism, uh, too close to the camera, too far away, bring the camera out. If you have anything like that you'd like to share for us, then go ahead and we'll just try to make it better the next time we do it. They told me we were doing a YouTube live. I'm like, is that at the mall? I don't even know what a YouTube live is. And I was like, YouTube. -y. So trying to change it up a little bit, make it more interactive, make it more like we're there in person. So if you have some comments, feel free to send them. Yep. This was our very first YouTube uh, live stream. So we'll learn a lot from it and we'll, we'll improve and we'll make changes as we go forward and there are into our next segments and things like that. But any feedback that you can give us would be great. Uh, well, gentlemen, we're getting thanks in the chat. Uh, so they, once again, thank you all for joining. This was a good experiment for Viavi. Uh, this is just the showrunner talking right now. Uh, we have plenty of how-to content on our Viavi YouTube channels and our viaviyoutube.com pages. So 
uh, please encourage you. There are some links to glow in the description of this live stream that can either take you to learn more about fiber communications with Fiavi Solutions and fiber testing. Uh, if you need to contact sales, there is a link down there that you can contact sales to talk about fiber inspection equipment. And then there's also a link to our how-to product uh, you know, channel for more how-to product videos on learning how to do OTDR inspection, fiber inspection, um, all types of different uh, testing stuff that we do here at Viavi. Uh, over to you, gentlemen, for a final closeout. Well, thanks, Evan, for that. And then one thing we do as, as engineers is somebody said, hey, how do I learn about the profile? Well, you can pay money for the IEC standard or open the software. So a lot of times we do make quick cards, which are in writing. A lot of folks now prefer videos. So we can go to laptop, make a three minute video. If you wanna learn what the pass fail is for each profile, here's how you do it. The same way somebody said, we want to combine our inspection image with our OTDR results. From memory, I don't know if we have that video, but if that's the case, I know we got a quick card for it, and we just say, okay, we'll crank out a three-minute video. You know how to use the OTDR. You know how to use a scope. Now we just watch a three-minute video that shows how to do it. So if folks need assistance for something they're trying to do, whatever the product is, then we try to make videos three, four, five minutes, right? Not an hour webinar where we cover everything, little video for one specific subject. All I got to do is say thank you all for attending, and like I said, I hope you got something out of this. We learned a lot from this one, and we appreciate your time and look forward to being on the next one. Thank you all.